I'm Bruce Bugbee, president of Apogee Instruments, and in today's video we'd like to talk about net radiation. And I want to talk about the evolution of in measurements and models to get to this key parameter, and particularly the evolution of instruments. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes some of the instruments that we've used to measure this. Here's why it's so important. We talk about it all the time, but not everybody has a good understanding of it. What we really want to know is how much to irrigate crops. And we, there's no sensor to measure the flux of water vapor coming out of a crop directly. We always use indirect measurements. One of the most time-honored and classic measurements is to measure all the parameters. Is it called the energy balance model? and measure all the parameters around it and then by subtraction get at transpiration. Here's what the model looks like. So we have R N, which is the thing we're talking about, equals lambda E T evapotranspiration plus H is sensible heat flux plus G is soil heat flux. Now these are classic symbols. You don't need to know them to understand net radiation, except we can do a reasonable job of measuring this and this. And if we can measure net radiation by subtraction, we can calculate the irrigation needs of a crop. Now this exact same simple model is used to determine global warming as well. So net radiation is the key driver, so we really need accurate measurements of that, both for global warming issues and for crop irrigation needs. So let's take a look at the state of the art of this about 10 years ago. 2005, the American Society for Civil Engineers came out with this book. Crop evapotranspiration, and this whole book is about the details of calculating that equation I just drew up there. And in the beginning of the book, it makes this statement. Net radiation is difficult to measure. So we recommend, this is a whole society, we recommend modeling net radiation from shortwave radiation, vapor pressure, and air temperature. This prediction is highly accurate. So we measure, a, we model a lot of things in science. We model the things we have trouble measuring, but we co-evolve measurements and models to get the most accurate analysis of everything we do. I want to look in a minute at where we've come since this statement was written in terms of instruments to measure net radiation. Now it's worth talking about the person that was the editor of this book. This is my friend and colleague Rick Allen, who was at Utah State University when this, he did all this work, and he felt strongly about this because he saw a lot of people making bad measurements, and he said it should, you should model it. The model for this is not all that trivial. Here it is. Four components, some assumptions for these things. I'm not going to get into this model. But you can, you can easily look at it in the book, or you can pause on this slide and see all the components. So the model's got plenty of challenges as well. Now let's switch to measurements from the model. And for this, we fast forward four years to 2009. We did a massive field study of all the state-of-the-art net radiometers at the time and ran them for all summer long. Um, carefully cleaned the domes on a daily basis, leveled them. Here's all the instruments on our, on our rig. One, two, three, four, five different types of instruments, three replicates of each. Here's the models and the, the number of outputs of each. Now let's, before we get into the number of outputs, let's take a look at these. Now, before I even show you these, we were studying net radiation well before this with state-of-the-art instruments at the time. And let me show you a very classic instrument. This one is in our museum now. We didn't use it in the study, but instruments 
precision instruments used to come in wood boxes. And this is a Swiss Taiko net radiometer made by a Swiss company that was state-of-the-art for many years. Had to have a pump and inflate the domes, um, but, it, but it attempted to do short-wave and long-wave measurements. And it's a, it's a gorgeous instrument. It's since been replaced by several other instruments. So let's start at the low end. One of our instruments was this one. This is a radiation and energy balance systems model Q7.1. It attempts to get at radiation by, and all of these are net, so they have an incoming and an outgoing, just by one simple black body that attempts to balance short and long wave radiation. This is the lowest cost of these instruments in the study, and we're going to look at how this did. The next one up is a Kippen's on an NR light. You can see these fine plates on here. This again is similar, doing net and long wave radiation with one single output from this. This is sensitive to wind. Wind cools it, so there's a wind correction for this, which we used in this study. Then we keep going up. This is the Huxaflux that you can see these on the screen, but now look at this instrument. Four separate sensors. Short wave in, short wave out, long wave in, long wave out. Four outputs. This is a considerable step up from these other instruments. And then finally, the most expensive instrument of all is this Kippenzonen CNR1, which is shown in our pictures. Oh, we've got the CNR1 in this study. Um, the CNR1 is the predecessor to this. That's a big and heavy instrument right here. This came out after this study. It's a similar instrument, same company. It's a slight upgrade from that. Again, it has four outputs, two on the bottom, two on the top. So, how'd this come out? Well, these are ranked by from the bottom to the top in increasing order of price and not terribly surprisingly the accuracy went up with the increasing price. So it's sort of like you get what you pay for but one of the absolutely clear things we found out about this was these instruments that had four outputs were fundamentally more accurate than the ones that only had one or two. Remember these instruments that just have two sides like this. They just give you one number and they attempt to separate short wave fluxes and long wave fluxes. And that's very challenging to do. It's easier to measure them separately. So I want to put on this a green box around this because the two most expensive ones with four outputs were also the most accurate in this study. So this was a lot of data, um, it very carefully analyzed with multiple outputs. This is Mark Blomquist, who was the uh, Apogee chief scientist that I've worked with for a long time on this, out here polishing and leveling these instruments in the field. And at the end of the summer, we published this in Agriculture and Forest Meteorology. So you can go to this paper and see all the details of this study and the separate pros and cons, but in a nutshell, the thing we came away from this was, with from this was four-way instruments are better than, than the lesser instruments. Now, I said models might be better than measurements. Let's take a look at what we found from that. All of the instruments in this study were more accurate than the model. So we fundamentally disprove that statement that if the instruments are level and clean, they're more accurate than the model. We ought to be measuring net radiation. The more expensive instruments were a lot more accurate. And how, how far off were they? Here's a simple graph out of many that we did. The model was 10% high compared to measurements. Here's the measurements. Um, so 
10% high, you know, that's not that much. You're going to overwater 10%, waste 10% to the water? Water's a really precious resource. I consider a 10% error in this model to be pretty significant. And since this paper came out, we have seen an enormous number of people switch to measuring this from modeling it. This was also published in another paper in agricultural water management that really made the point that this, the measurements are better than the model. So, our colleague Rick Allen was on record saying the model is the best. So guess what? Rick Allen. He became a co-author with us on this paper to, to make a very clear statement that the instruments are better. So that led to using instruments. Now we fast forward a few more years and because Apogee Instruments has a long history of measuring these parameters, Apogee started working on a new design for a net radiometer that incorporated four components into a single instrument and has an intermediate price. This is the design that Apogee has just recently released after four years of refinement and testing. It's a four component radiometer, short wave in, short wave out, long wave in, long wave out. This would take up, all of these instruments take up a lot of channels on a data acquisition system, and which are precious channels that can be used for other things. So in this, we made the output SDI 12, and it only takes up an SDI 12 channel you can have multiple sensors in the same channel. So we consider this a pretty fundamental breakthrough in the world of measuring net radiation. It's small, easy to level, and has, as I'm going to show you a minute, has very comparable accuracy to the highest end instruments that cost considerably more. One of the challenges of measuring radiation is condensation on sensors and snow on sensors. For that reason, the Huxaflux has a heater in it. It's a, a one and a half watt heater, so it's very significant. You have to have a big solar panel to run this heater. The Kippenzonen also, for extra money, has this shield. It's both of these high-end instruments have heaters to try and keep the instrument cleaned so you make accurate measurements in all weather. The Apogee, because it's smaller, has tiny heaters in each of these four sensors to keep the domes clean. Let's look at what that looks like when we put these heaters in. Here's a winter day, a few years ago, frost in the morning, it didn't even snow, it was just frost, it was covering everything, the heaters are clean. And this is just a fraction of the power. This can easily be run from solar-powered weather stations. We got a lot of pictures of this thing. Here's the same sensor, um, different angle showing the frost. This part doesn't need to be heated here, but these are nice and clean. So that was another advance of being able to heat this thing. How accurate is it? Well, we have deployed this in the field you can tell this is Utah because we have mountains in the background. Over a big alfalfa field, over 15 months, over a year, we compared them to the high-end Kippenzonen. This is the most expensive of all the instruments. And we had three triplicate Apogee net radiometers on this tower. So through the winter, through the summer, comparing the accuracy, here's the data. Here's the Kippenzonen, here's the Apogee, 15 months in the field, all of them track the Kippenzonen very accurately. There's a few scattered points in here, and this is because something got on the sensor. Sometimes it got on the reference sensor and caused problems. This was not heated. This didn't have the heated shield, so there are times when this had an error 
But the point of this is we're very pleased with this accuracy. Um, it's, it's been over a year since we've done that. So the take home messages from all of this now are it's cost effective to measure net radiation and as opposed to modeling it on, on all stations and in the world of cost effectiveness we feel that this Apogee net radiometer really fits a niche for very high accuracy and yet moderate cost. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again in another session. Thank <laughs> you.